Happy Father's Day. Dads, stepdads, foster dads, fathers-in-law, spiritual dads, we celebrate with you. And single moms, we see you and honor you today as well. I am super excited. My stepdad and my father-in-law are both here in the room with me today. And my dad is watching online from Muncie, Pennsylvania. So hi, dad. (laughs) When psychologist Florida Scott Maxwell was 85, she wrote, you need only claim the events of your life to make yourself yours. When you truly possess all you have been and done, you are fierce with reality. Fierce with reality is how I feel when I'm able to say, I am that to which I gave short shrift and that to which I attended. I am my descents into darkness and my rising again into the light. My doubts and my convictions, my fears and my hopes. Wholeness does not mean perfection. It means embracing brokenness as an integral part of life. I'm grateful for this truth as age leads me to look back on the zigzagging up and down path I've hacked out during my far from perfect life. My own story is hard and it's messy, but it's mine. There are a lot of times over the years when I seriously questioned whether or not I would get through it. I have lived a lot of life. My parents divorced when I was small and unfortunately the man who entered our lives afterward was angry and violent. I actually don't remember a lot of my childhood, but some of the blips I do feel more like nightmares. I have carried and am healing the wounds of childhood trauma, abandonment and rejection issues, and I have fought hard for my self-esteem. Growing into my teenage years, I struggled with deep depression and to counter how I felt on the inside and in an effort to never have to come face to face with what I had been through, I put on a bright, happy facade If everyone around me could believe that everything was okay, maybe I could fool myself into feeling okay too. But part of what happens when we conceal our vulnerabilities and our pain is we deny those around us the opportunity to really know us. As a teen, I didn't know how to communicate to adults around me that I needed help. I wanted someone to just see through the mask and rescue me. I was carrying deep trauma that I didn't know what to do with, and I just wanted to feel better. So to numb the sting, I sought the comfort and the attention of boys. So this was in the early 2000s when purity culture ran rampant in youth groups, and it dictated that our value as women hinged on our purity. Any deviation from the pristine picture of wholesomeness and virginity was seen as tarnishing our worth. Does anybody remember the book, I Kissed Dating Goodbye? Oh, it's a lot of fans, I hear, yeah. <laughs> if you don't, it warns that dating could cause irreparable emotional damage. The solution is to embrace courtship, where couples pursue friendship before romance and parents are given permission to offer advice and help guide the relationship. It also pushed super strict boundaries, no kissing, no holding hands, and no being alone together before you get married. The author recommends only beginning a relationship with someone if you could picture yourself marrying them in the near future. So I did not kiss dating goodbye. I kissed dating straight on the mouth. (laughs) I had new crushes all the time. I loved the affirmation that came with flirting and affection. But what was underneath it was that the affection, however brief, quenched a deep desire to feel chosen. I remember during youth group, we did a book study once in our small groups. The boys read one book and we read another. The girl's book talks about a girl who is in public school and finds herself attracted to a boy. Oh no. In order to protect her purity, she decides she needs to stop going to public school and stop consuming any media that wasn't exclusively Christian. And what this book taught was that every time you held hands, kissed, or even so much as thought about a guy that you weren't going to marry, it was like putting a stain on your future wedding dress. And what would your future husband think if you showed up at the altar with a stained wedding dress? If you grew up in youth group during this time, you probably went through a few of these sermons. The youth pastor passes around a rose that's supposed to represent your virginity. It gets passed through the crowd. And at the end, when it makes its way back up to the stage, the pastor holds up this tattered, crumpled rose and asks, who would want this? And spoiler alert, Jesus does. (laughs) 
Another one is someone squeezes a tube of toothpaste, and then the goal is to try to get all the toothpaste back into the tube. The picture being, you can't. No matter what you do, no matter how much of it you successfully get back in the tube, it'll never be full again. There's toothpaste residue out there, the tube is permanently altered, just like your purity. The damaging message that dug its claws into me, and probably the rest of us purity culture survivors, was that I was already ruined. I had my first kiss in seventh grade. I thought about boys constantly. My bedroom wall was covered in cute celebrities and boy bands. Pin the scarlet A on me. In the eyes of some of my youth group peers, I was a floozy. So I developed that reputation, however undeserved, and I became the target of a bully. I endured constant scrutiny, judgment, and condemnation. It felt as if it was her personal mission to make sure I knew that I would never measure up. She and her friends were perfect, but no matter what I did, I would never be good enough. I can remember doing Bible studies where the topic would suddenly turn on me because of a shirt I wore or a swimsuit I wore to a pool party that was, she thought was too scandalous. During that time, I also started to experience near daily sexual harassment from a boy I went to youth group with. And when I asked for help from my leader, I was told that I was the problem. That if I looked, dressed, or acted another way, a better way, that I wouldn't tempt the boys into behaving this way toward me. I learned early on that any unwanted attention was my fault. I invited it. That if a boy who was raised in a perfect Christian home with parents who were still together, who went to a private Christian school, and who had done everything right, would want to say and do those things to me that the flawed character was not in him because he had done everything right. It was me. It was my character that was slipping him up. I was the one being violated and somehow he was the victim. Why didn't anyone see it? Why was nobody speaking up for me? Why would nobody advocate for me? And what I had settled on was that's just who I was. I was broken. There was nothing I was ever going to be able to do to fix it. I was the tattered rose, the squished up tube of toothpaste. And that thought settled deep in my heart and took root. I was broken, irreparable. I was hard to love. This ate away at my self-esteem until it was non-existent. And into young adulthood, that lack of self-worth led me to poor decision-making, self-destructive behavior, and allowed me to accept a lot of treatment that I didn't deserve and a constant pattern of people-pleasing to try to earn love. I so badly wanted to feel full acceptance, and all the while telling myself that it wasn't really something I deserved. After years of this, I felt like a shell of a person. I didn't know who I was anymore, and it felt like I was sleepwalking through my own life. When I went back to church after a few years away, that was the first time I had heard about God's grace. What I had heard before was how God loved us enough to save us from sin. But the emphasis was always on how horrible I was for God to have to do that. For the first time, I heard someone speak openly about their imperfections and about God's unwavering love. And it awakened something within me. And it's something that continues to uplift me to this day. God chooses us. He has seen the depths of our lives and the complexities of our minds, and yet he still chooses us. In Psalm 18, our scripture for today, we discover a profound expression of God's relentless love and intentional choice to rescue and bless his people. David's desperate cry for help resonates with us as we face our own overwhelming circumstances. I love that in this psalm, David captures the sheer magnitude of God's emotions toward our circumstances. It's a beautiful and an intense picture of a God who can create a storm of hailstones and fire and thunder and lightning after a cry out from one of his own. This is such a comfort to me because it's an example of a God who is so deeply acquainted with our lived human experience that he doesn't just sit in a lofty place to watch our hearts break. God sits in it with us, and it matters enough for him, to feel, for him to feel passionate about it. The Psalms are full of examples of pouring out confusion and pain to God, and God doesn't ask us to be fake about what hurts us. 
It can be really easy for us to slip into toxic positivity when things go wrong, to stuff down our hurt and our anger and just say, well, the joy of the Lord is my strength. But everything sucks and we feel weak and we're run down. But nothing about your story needs to be buttoned up or in a pretty package for it to be seen and valued by God. David recognized that it was God who chose to reach down from heaven, rescue him, and draw him out of deep waters. And it's crucial for us to acknowledge that our salvation, redemption, and our calling are all initiated by God's sovereign choice. God's love for us is not based on our merit or our efforts, but solely on his divine grace. We don't have to earn our way into his affections. We don't have to do or perform We just simply have to be, and he chooses us. It says, but me he caught, reached all the way down from sky to sea. He pulled me out of that ocean of hate, that enemy chaos, the void in which I was drowning. They hit me when I was down, but God stuck by me. He stood me up on a wide open field. I stood there saved, surprised to be loved. This is such a stunning picture David's painting of God rescuing us because he delights in us. It reveals the enormity of God's love, reaching beyond mere rescue. God chooses us not only to save us from sins and deliver us from trials, but also to delight in us and have an intimate relationship with us. God's choosing encompasses every aspect of our lives, providing comfort, peace, and a joy that surpasses human understanding. God made my life complete when I placed all the pieces before him. When I got my act together, he gave me a fresh start. Now I'm alert to God's ways. I don't take God for granted. Every day I review the ways he works. I try not to miss a trick. I feel put back together and I'm watching my step. God rewrote the text of my life when I opened the book of my heart to his eyes. The good people taste your goodness. The whole people taste your health. The true people taste your truth. The bad ones can't figure you out. You take the side of the down and out, but the stuck up you take down a notch. Suddenly, God, you floodlight my life. I'm blazing with glory, God's glory. I smash the bands of marauders. I vault the highest fences. What a God. His road stretches straight and smooth. Every God direction is road tested. Everyone who runs toward him makes it. In Charles Spurgeon's commentary, he says, with faith, how easy all exploits become. When we have no faith, though, to fight with enemies and overcome difficulties is hard work indeed. But when we have faith, oh, how easy are victories. What does the believer do? There is a troop. Well, he runs in faith then to fight with enemies and overcome difficulties is hard wall. What about that? He leaps over it. It is amazing how easy life becomes when a man has faith. Does faith diminish difficulties? Oh no, it increaseth them, but it increaseth his strength to overcome them. If thou hast faith, thou shalt have trials, but thou shalt do great exploits, endure great privations, and get triumphant victories. When we recognize that God has chosen us, we can find strength and refuge in him. We often face challenges, temptations, and doubts, but when we lean on God's strength and take refuge in him, we find victory over our struggles. God's choice of us means that we have access to his power, wisdom, and guidance to navigate through life's ups and downs. As recipients of God's choosing, we're called to reflect his love to the world around us. Just as God chose us when we were undeserving, we are also called to extend love, grace, and compassion to others. Our lives become a living testimony to God's amazing grace, drawing others to experience his love and salvation. I had this experience a while back where I was talking about my teenage years to someone who was an adult and knew me then. And they said something along the lines of, oh my gosh, we just loved you. You were so great. And I thought, wow, if you had just taken the time to tell me that then, what a difference that would have made for me. So I've spent a lot of time recently doing something called inner child work. And it's an approach to recognizing and healing childhood trauma. It recognizes that our behaviors as an adult stem from our childhood experiences, and it focuses on addressing our unmet needs by reparenting ourselves. 
For me, this looks like practicing self-compassion, speaking things over myself that I needed to hear, identifying my emotional triggers, and giving myself a reassurance of safety. And as I've prepared for this message, I shifted my focus to my inner teenager. Will you put that picture up, please? So this is me, my senior year at Clayton Valley. I was singing the Star Spangled Banner at the homecoming rally. <laughs> and I look at the 17-year-old version of myself, and I can remember that moment, how very myself and alive singing made me feel, and it still does. And I think of how desperately I wish I could hug her and share with her how fully and completely God loves her, how the faults and the flaws that she sees in herself don't really matter. He's not embarrassed by her. She's not too much or not enough. How seen and known and how insanely valued she is, not because of anyone's attention or based on perceived purity, how she's chosen and accepted, wholly and completely just as she is. And what a gift and how healing it is for me to get to stand here today and be the church leader that I needed to tell you the same thing. You are seen. You are known. You are valued. You are chosen. You are accepted wholly and completely just as you are. <laughs>